All of y'all are tripping. Habib Nurmagomedov is no role model. Ooh, what you say? So right, I said it. Greatest lightweight champion the UFC has ever seen. A name in every GOAT conversation. The man who retired without ever losing a fight and only ever losing one round. Not a fucking role model. Why? He's spoken about it before, saying the weight of his celebrity is heavy on his shoulders. He's happy to be seen as an example of a great athlete, but not of a Muslim and not of a man. <laughs> To Habib, the only role model is the Prophet Muhammad, and that's where people should look for guidance. It's Habib's faith that is the foundation of everything he is, everything he has achieved, everything he continues to do. He believes that when Allah is with you, nobody can beat you, and every success that you have is because Allah wants it for you. Imagine never second-guessing your choices or your purpose, or your path, because you believe there is no choice. The path is set. Many fighters from Dagestan share the same belief that they are destined for greatness. And that means they have to train hard. They have to push themselves. They have to keep going. You can fight, but you can't fight destiny. So why fighting? Why is it that this is the path Allah has set for so many from this small region? Now, Dagestan is known for its stunning mountainous landscapes and for its history of political unrest and violence. The violence goes back a lot further than this, but in the 90s, Chechen insurgents declared independence from Russia and invaded Dagestan. And this conflict was an especially brutal one in the region's history, taking tens of thousands of lives. And Habib would have been just three when it began. Of course, growing up under these horrors would have instilled an indomitable spirit. But for Dagestan, it instilled a lot more than that. To divert aggression into something more productive. The region introduced an exercise-based strategy that teaches discipline and instills pride. With wrestling at its core, this initiative seeks to prevent the young men of Dagestan from entering the forest, which is how they refer to the Islamic insurgents. This purpose to move away from the horrors of the past and as a community create a better future is one of the reasons why athletes from Dagestan and Habib very notably within our MMA world are cut above the rest. The region has phenomenal access to training in combat sambo, judo, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, boxing, which make up all the most important aspects of MMA. Just as the USA has football as its national sport, Dagestan has wrestling. So with Allah behind him and an environment around him that breeds natural athletes, Habib's path was set to greatness. But the nurturing part of the puzzle wasn't only in the community's response to these horrors, it was a lot closer to home. Habib's father saw the horrors of conflict up close. Abdulmanop was a former Soviet soldier and highly regarded wrestler. Many of the Dagestani fighters we see doing great things today have Habib's father to thank for their exceptional training. These young men grew up preparing for battle, but under the freestyle wrestler's masterful eye, took a much safer path to victory. And just as Habib is no role model, his father is no coach. The word coach undermines everything that he has done for the young men of Dagestan and for the MMA world. He never set out to develop athletes. He developed human beings that could see a future without war, that could achieve their purpose under Allah. And one vehicle for this development was sport. He invested whatever he needed to in people. He chose a small group of young men, not for their existing athletic prowess or sporting accomplishments. He worked with them for 14 years, crafting every element of a successful MMA fighter. Abdulmanop was not a loud, shouty coach. 
He was very attentive and he instilled discipline. If someone stepped out of line, he'd make them suffer the consequences, but that was mostly just the crushing weight of his disappointment. Don't waste the time of anyone who's here to work. That was his thing. And this discipline is so key. The path is set. The terrain is optimal. All you have to do is work. Khabib got a head start on the discipline lesson, wrestling under his father's tutelage from a very young age. And when he was 12, he started formal training in multiple disciplines, but always following father's plan. Those two words morphed into a trigger for all the athletes who once trained under Abdul Manop to remind them of the game plan during fights or during tough times during training camp. If Coach Mendez sees them veering off course, all he needs to do is utter those two words. It reminds them why they're doing this. They are all connected to something so much bigger than themselves. But of course, Father's plan is much more intricate than that. Beyond recognizing each individual's fighter's skills and path to victory, Habib's father saw their career timelines mapped out. He always said that Habib would fight to 30 and 0, with one of his last fights being a move up to welterweight to face Georges St. Pierre. Which is why we can't, as a community, ever really count out Habib coming back for that special fight, although he says it's not on the cards. Abdulmanop said that Islam would be the next champion after Habib, basically a passing of the baton, which Habib always jokes with Islam about because obviously he's running behind. Abdulmanop saw the big plan for each of his athletes, and that's a special skill that few have in any industry. But the minute picture, came down to the preparation. Like I said, faith is the foundation, the environment around Habib provided the resources, his father provided the knowledge, but day to day it always came down to discipline. To take all that is available to you and turn it into something great. Most of us probably grew up with a few hobbies here and there, but had free time to spend playing with our friends. I don't know, watching TV, playing video games, perfecting our MySpace profiles, not Habib. He would wake up, train, go to school. School was never put on the back burner for fighting, which is probably why he speaks like five or six languages, depending on your source, has a degree in finances, and is also a successful businessman. Then after school, he'd have extra tutoring. Then he'd train again, then more studying. Then sometimes he'd train again at like 11 p.m. As a small child, just running by himself in the mountains. From the youngest age, he understood that the person who is the most prepared will win, whatever that winning means. He was always striving to do better and more than everyone else in the entire world. And that intense training schedule stayed with him for his entire career. He runs as naturally as a fish swims. His training regime looks to be the epitome of perfection. Of course, training all the skills of MMA daily, but also creating the ideal balance of cardio, core, upper body strength and conditioning, lower body strength and conditioning, flexibility, agility, mobility. Any one of us can figure out a plan like that, but it's discipline that means that he sticks to it. No corners were ever cut in the making of Habib Nurmagomedov. While he started out in Dagestan and continued throughout his career to train in Dagestan, both he and his father knew that he was never gonna really carve out his competitive advantage if he was only taking in the knowledge of one region. His professional career was spent split between his hometown and the US, and he extracted the benefits of each with surgeon-like precision. In Dagestan, he runs on the harsh terrain, making the most of the high altitude to raise the number of red blood cells and improve his cardio advantage. They'll follow the run with an hour of pad work, and all this before breakfast. The Dagestani camps train together two or three times a day, and that's not all. They are truly bonded, taking lovely, wholesome naps together as well. Following the nap, they'll do like a two or three mile hike up a mountain, wrestling at the top as you do. And of course, you've probably heard about the other more irregular training tactics involving bears and small children. Habib never settles in his top dog position, always looking for ways to improve his skills and therefore only training with the best training partners, many of which of course can be found in Dagestan, but many of which can also be found at AKA in the US. A true champion needs to be great at as many styles as possible 
and American wrestling is very different to Dagestani wrestling. So we found training partners like DC in America to help build out his skill set. And you can bet he also increased his striking skills as well. Now despite the fact that his earnings increased with his success and they started out low with his first UFC contract, I believe, guaranteeing him six grand. He always seemed to keep his training pretty low tech, running calisthenics, Russian sauna, shadow boxing, etc. And of course it all paid off in the octagon, if he could actually get there. Let's not be looking through rose-tinted glasses here. Habib's greatest opponents were his weight and the numerous injuries that he suffered in his career. They prevented him from fighting so regularly that he once considered packing it all in and becoming a bouncer so he could provide for his family. But his dad told him, your job is to eat well and go to the gym. It took us such a long time to get here and we're not gonna give up that easily. And luckily for us, he didn't, because when he was healthy, he was poetry. Yes, he was known for his wrestling. He was always 100% committed to a takedown and never stopped chain wrestling, putting sequences together, forcing his opponent to the outside and diving for their legs or backing them up against the cage using his head on their hip to control half their body while simultaneously attempting trips to get them to the ground. He was a natural in the clinch and where many fighters are afraid of the cage, thinking that their opponent will use it to get back to their feet, he used it offensively, almost like an extra limb for controlling them. His understanding of positioning and balance are unmatched, and he was never in a rush. We'd often see him body locking his opponent, draining them of every ounce of their energy, and then once they were exhausted, getting them down with a judo style hip throw. And once they were down, it only got worse for them from there. The word maul has never been so appropriately used. His top control was inescapable. He was so active on the ground, always looking to improve position. He'd wrap the legs, which is a sambo, trademark style, leaving his arms free to implement damage. And the power he could generate from that top position was immense, just ask Edson Barboza. <laughs> he would beat your frickin' soul out. And this unbeatable wrestling serves more than its obvious purpose. Yes, he is that good, but when you're facing Habib, you're facing the myth, the legend. His name is synonymous with wrestling in the MMA community. So you spend all your time fearing the takedown, and you at best don't follow your game plan, and at worst make huge mistakes. But of course he's not in the GOAT conversation for just having one discipline to his name. His striking was slower to develop and highly criticised throughout his run, but the mind games he plays on the feet extended to his strikes as well. He would explode with wild hooks, step in with uppercuts to close distance or force the opponent towards the cage. He'd feint a takedown and come over the top with a strike. He even knocked Connor down, which is something that many celebrated strikers were unable to do. He was able to generate a lot of power behind his punching, because of his compact style. He rarely extended his arms fully, which allowed him to put combinations together quickly and block anything coming his way. His style is just not what we were used to seeing, and I think that's where a lot of the criticism comes from. Sambo striking is about staying out of danger, staying patient, searching for that opening, using jabs at volume to occupy the guard, and then closing the distance at the perfect moment. However he chose to execute his mauling, once he knew that he had broken his opponent, he'd start executing his mouth as well, advising them they should probably just give up. Some people see this as a mind game, like demoralising his opponents further. But Habib says it was a mark of respect. He says he didn't want to hurt Michael Johnston. He didn't want to smash his face. He wanted him to give up to avoid further damage. And when that didn't happen, he says he went for the Kimura really slowly to avoid breaking Johnston's arm. And when he fought Justin Gaethje, he had the opportunity to secure an armbar, which is a really painful submission that can lead to lasting damage if the opponent doesn't tap, and you know Gaethje ain't gonna tap. So Habib refused the opportunity, instead switching to securing a body position and the choke that, while still offering extreme discomfort, results in a swift submission and no lasting damage. He has spoken before about not feeling 100% comfortable that his sport demands damage and pain to show superiority. He says that he loves football because you can show how good you are through beauty. Bet you didn't know he was such a romantic, eh? Well, actually, he married his first love. He and his wife sat together in school. 
adorable. And by now you've probably noticed a strong theme of family and community running through this story. Of course, his father passing was the catalyst for his retirement, but it was a promise he made to his mother that sealed the deal. He gives back to his own community and others in need more often than we're made aware of. I talked about that in the Dagestani Warriors video, so I won't repeat myself, but I will link it for you on the end screen. But it's a common principle that all the fighters from Dagestan, both well known and below the radar, prioritize supporting each other being humble and doing what's right. They understand the importance of giving back to younger wrestlers and MMA fighters, the ones coming up behind them. And now that he's no longer competing himself, it was only natural that Habib would carry on his father's legacy. Prior to Abdul Nop's young group of fighters, there had never been a UFC fighter from Dagestan. And in a way, his legacy is still being written, with Habib now at the helm. He slipped seamlessly into the empty shoes, addressing the team every day on the mats just as his father did, telling them what he expects, shaping them. Everything his father once did, now Habib does. And he does it so well. He's not quite unbeaten as a coach, but damn close. He's carrying on father's plan with his focus very astutely on Islam currently. Islam was his father's favorite student. Like another son, his father would always say that Islam is the future champion. And that's why Habib has to be on those mats with him to finish what his father started. And he's happy to do it, to use his time in this way. He says that time is the thing that people underestimate the most. When he was following his first purpose to be the best martial artist in the world, all of his time was spent training. His body was exhausted because he always pushed it to the limit. And now he's free to spend his time differently. To have a little sleep before lunch if he wants. To live more for himself and others around him, not devoting himself 100% to the sport. And while he's spending his time focusing on others, he knows that as time passes, people around the world will start to better understand father's plan and the real genius of the man now lost. He says time will pass and history will tell the story. Like, subscribe, come back next week, and it'll soon be time for us to start talking about Islam and this exciting title matchup that I am, I mean, Mostly just treading water up until October 22nd, really.